Welcome to Treatise on Treaties, Episode 1, Introduction, or What is a State? In our time, we can observe that states interact with each other on a regular and mostly peaceful basis. After the First World War, attacking other nations was, for the first time, officially outlawed by the League of Nations. But before this incredible event, and this may not come as a surprise, not every political difference between states was solved on the battlefield. Not every war was fought to the utter destruction or annihilation of one side. Polities, states and nations have coexisted, cooperated and conflicted with each other since humans have started to form settlements, or maybe even before that. Yet, just as within the borders of every working polity up to this point, at least coexistence and cooperation do not work without agreeing on certain rules. People living next to each other without any rules might, over the course of time, act on their own interests and actively hamper the interests of others. Polities existing next to each other might just do the same on a macro level. It is at this point where treaties chime into the story. But what is a treaty? It is not too hard to find a definition for that. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines a treaty as a binding formal agreement, contract or other written instrument that establishes obligations between two or more subjects of international law. Sounds easy enough, doesn't it? Well, there's still a lot to unpack here. What are states? How can any document or written agreement be binding if no institution watches over them? And did treaties not exist until the proper formation of states? Maybe it is time to introduce this podcast. Hi, my name is Matthias and welcome to Treaties on Treaties, a podcast explaining the development of the international system based on treaties and agreements. While those treaties and contracts between polities have existed since, at the very least, the Middle Ages, we will put a first focus on the era after the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. Why? Well, keep on listening. I intend to create three introductory episodes explaining the basic concepts underlying my analyses. This time we will talk briefly about the emergence of the basic unique of Britannica's definition. States, their emergence and the concept of statehood as opposed to different polities. In the second episode, we will take a peek at the discussion about the relevance of the Peace of Westphalia in determining the beginning of the international system. In the final introductory episode we try to get a brief overview of some of the grand systemic theories of international relations to explain why nations enter into treaties, why they might break them, and how much treaties are really worth. We will focus mainly on four of the most common theories, neorealism, liberalism, neoliberal institutionalism, and social constructivism. So prepare for a little bit of a tour de force. After those introductions, we will jump right into the fray. Over the course of the regular show, we will look at certain treaties over the course of history in a mini-series format. In short seasons of two to four episodes, we will discuss the historical context of treaties, the processes in their creation, their immediate effects and their long-time effects on the creation of the international system we have the, arguably, great joy of living in. So the grand thesis of this show is that we can deconstruct and construct the history of international politics to a certain extent as to understand how and why nations either coexist or enter into conflict and how those conflicts might be solved. As such, we hope to achieve an understanding of the international system of politics of which we, or you for yourself, might deduce lessons we can apply to the world today. The first mini-series will deal with the treaties of Utrecht, Rastatt and Baden, commonly referred to as the Peace of Utrecht, ending the war of the Spanish succession in 1713 and 1714. In between series, we will sometimes take a look at certain concepts or current events 
to reinforce points made and give us a little breather between different treaties. This might happen from time to time, and if you have questions on specific topics or want me to enunciate on something that has not been that clear, I would be glad to incorporate these into Q&A episodes whenever possible. Feel free to message me at treatiseontreaties at gmail.com with any ideas, questions and suggestions at any time. I would also like to advise you that I am not a lawyer, therefore I am not fluent in legalese. We will not analyze most of the documents themselves in depth, but rather look at effects and concepts, creating the necessity to facilitate those. I am, for my part, a political sciences student minoring in history, and I see this project as an addition to my studies. Therefore, if you are a scholar yourself, I would love to hear your thoughts and suggestions on methodology or maybe a few useful tips on research. That has been a lot of yapping on my noble goals, but let's cut with the chase. In this episode, as I said, we will focus on the concept of statehood and what makes it different from other older forms of polity. We will examine the creation of the European state over the course of the early modern age and talk about how and why they formed. So, let's talk state. What is a state? Why has humanity decided that living in a state is the preferable and most popular form of social coexistence inside regulated borders? To speak with the popular political scientist Francis Fukuyama, all states are primarily predatory organizations. Sounds libertarian to you? Fukuyama makes this statement without any normative insinuation. Instead, he argues that the main function of a state, and the main reason for its formation, is the optimal and efficient extraction of revenue for many purposes, but first and foremost, warfare. States, from this perspective, are social constructs that provide a single, centralized, insurmountable authority based on institutions that govern daily life to the benefit of their inhabitants, insofar as they offer protection for the very small price of taxing them, as well as raising tariffs on their goods. For the sake of argument, I would like to describe the roots of European states according to Francis Fukuyama. It is very important that his book, The Origins of Political Order, which I wholeheartedly recommend, makes a big point out of the creation of states east of Europe, especially China, India and the Middle East. For the sake of digestibility, I will focus on Europe, however, as we will examine European treaties for the first few miniseries of this show, at least. Bear with my Eurocentrism here and take my pledge that I will try and change my ways as soon as we pinpointed the very basics of our research subject. Fukuyama argues that the concept of European statehood is based on the institution of the Catholic Church. He makes the point that through its function as the sole universal legislative authority for all Christian monarchs, after the investiture conflict and the ascendance of Gregory V to the Holy See, the church became something of a state itself, creating laws that every polity within its flock had to follow or face serious repercussions. You don't think so? Why don't you have a chat with Emperor Henry IV about it? As the Catholic Church provided canonical law, the local princes and mayors had to provide the necessary institutions to dispense justice according to this groundwork. Those institutions could be the Reichstag in the Holy Roman Empire, associations of merchants or craftsmen, militias and courts to provide law, order and stability. Yet, however, this dispensation of law and order through institutions does not make statehood alone. A state in the eyes of Fukuyama centralizes all authority and just gives it away to institutions that it creates and maintains itself. A medieval king, however, ruled not about his kingdom, but rather through his vassals, who maintained their own soldiery and collected their own taxes, giving only a part of them to their ruler. This, obviously, is problematic. How can you claim to be the authority of anything if your own army relies on contributions made by people you rule? What if they don't want to pay up anymore, or just decide to give you the boot by the power of their own little armies? Well, you simply can't. 
Oh, and good luck trying to crush any rebellious vessel. You know those pretty piles of stone that were scattered all over Europe? Chances are you've already visited one. I'm talking, of course, about castles. Until the widespread usage of gunpowder, castles were hard to take and provided any subject with his mind set on not paying you more taxes or giving you more troops with a great base of operations. But wait, what about the Roman Empire? What about the great city-states of ancient Greece? There was hardly any feudalism there, and land was mostly given away by central authority. You're not wrong. Yet of course, there has to be a caveat. Fukuyama makes the point that Rome, at least after the fall of the Republic with the consulates of Marius and Sulla, and the cities of ancient Hellas, could not be states. The key factor here is the relationship between the central authority and its military. In Roman Greece, charismatic and successful generals had the ability to grasp control of the government solely by their popularity or the sheer force of arms. The relative ease with which the triumvirate of Crassus, Pompey and Caesar, or Pericles and Athens, captured the authority in their polities while basically cutting down their institutions to size or, in the case of Caesar, defeating them on the battlefield at Munda, does not allow us to talk of those polities as states with central authority. And looking at the Roman Empire after Augustus and the Byzantine Empire in the 7th and 8th century and afterwards, military organizations like the Praetorian Guard or the themes like the Anatolikon or the Imperial Guard definitely had their undue say in the matter of who actually ran the shop. So, to conclude, European states were created as a result of the institutionalization of power as a result of the omnipresence of canonical law as a basis for Catholic best practice. Yet, why were those states formed? It can be argued that exogenous shocks due to the extremely costly religious and cabinet wars of the 17th and 18th centuries made it important for polities to mobilize more and more resources for warfare and centralize more and more power to do so. In the Thirty Years' War, for example, princes in Germany did not rely on the troops of their vassals as much anymore, but rather on mercenaries, the Landsknechte, whose financing was ridiculously costly. And as the war was fought between competing confessions, it was a little harder to withdraw your support from your liege by just staying out of the conflict or supporting the other side. Your own subjects could be revolting against you. With this centralization of authority and the creation of institutions, however, came the problem of creating a balance of power. Obviously, any legitimate central authority that met entrenched social groups without an interest to be taxed into little bits had to strike a deal that created an equilibrium of power as to not create the potential for rebellion. Fukuyama conceptualizes this balancing as a conflict between four distinct social groups and the emerging states. State versus high nobility, state versus more common gentry, State versus the third estate, comprising city dwellers and in general what you could call a bourgeoisie, and state versus peasants. Obviously, as you might imagine, those groups had interests widely different from each other. It is important to know that Fukuyama underlines that statehood means the absence of the patrimonial order of things, where family and kinship, basically tribalism, makes up the institutions of states and decides who the head of state actually is. As a result of the process of state building and the striking of a balance, he continues to create four different outcomes. First, the creation of a weak absolute monarchy with a powerful high nobility, who, in turn for their loyalty and the loss of direct control over their estate's income, had to be satisfied with filling the ranks of every institution in government jurisdiction and military. This was the case when an exceptionally powerful high nobility came out on top of the actual state but acquiesced to the necessity of creating one. In this model of state, patrimonialism finds a loophole in the staffing of the most important institutions of government, therefore reducing the central authority of the institution by making each appointment a power play between competing families. 
Fukuyama names France and Spain as examples of this rule. And we will take a look at the staffing of the diplomatic corps after the series on the Peace of Utrecht to give you an example of how nobility remained important for the sake of statehood. Second, strong absolute monarchy, where the state has clamped down on the nobility, turning them into a service nobility that might still have considerable estates, but did not have the power to oppose the state efficiently. Russia is being named as the only example, as the terror campaigns the early Tsars led against their nobilities left them weak and disunited. Third, a failed oligarchy. This was the case if a state tried to create an accountable government by introducing institutions that had some checks on the state but failed to create a good balance of power within the state. Poland, with its powerful parliament of nobles, mostly controlled by a select few magnates, comes to mind, where this powerful class dominated the state and every aspect of it, while exploiting the other groups and making the efficient mobilization of resources impossible. Here, any attempt to create accountability within the government is immediately hamstrung by patrimonial interests, which makes the institutions of a state utterly ineffective. Finally, an accountable government. When the state managed to create an equilibrium of power that held the government accountable while not overpowering it and limiting it in its ability to fulfill its job, that is, extracting revenue, an accountable government is created that is stable and holds all groups plus the state itself in check. The United Kingdom with its parliament as well as the Kingdom of Sweden are good examples for that. Now, you can of course argue about this concept of state. For example, the extraction of resources as a primary goal, and especially the singular purpose that those resources are to be used for. Yet I think if we can agree on the premises of this model, we could create a consensus on what we mean when we talk about states, at least for now. So, now that we know how and why states are formed, it is important to at least shed some light on one conception of a certain modus of the state. And since we already talked about the Thirty Years' War, we might as well talk about the concept of state and statehood created by the treaty that concluded this war, the Peace of Westphalia, signed 1648 in the German cities of Münster and Osnabrück, which is why we call it the Westphalian State and Westphalian Sovereignty. Next time, we will take a closer look at the concept of Westphalian Sovereignty, its possible role in the creation of the international system and the arguments that can be found against it. We will have a little discussion on this model of sovereignty as to understand how and why states interact and whether we can point a finger at some point in time and say, oh look, there's the international system. Stay tuned. I would love to hear your feedback on the idea of this podcast and the methods I have advertised the usage of. Of course, I'm always open to discuss certain points as well as answering any of your questions. If you enjoyed this first little foray into the large field of international politics we have undertaken today, I would like to ask you to subscribe to the show and possibly even tell a friend about what you found. As such, I hope you have a great time until we meet again. See you!